we'll go ahead and get started. So before I begin, I just want to um, say thank you to our partners and sponsors. We would not be able to fulfill our mission of promoting marine conservation through action without their help and support. And I specifically wanna thank uh, New York Parks Connects Kids to Parks program and Parks and Trails New York. So the learning objectives for this evening's program is I'm going to quickly introduce you to Atlantic Marine Conservation Society or as we like to say, AMCs, because that name can be pretty long. I'll review the species of sea turtles uh, found in the world and then the species that are found in New York, the threats they're facing in our waters and how you specifically can help the sea turtles. So first, what is AMCs? So AMCs is an organization that was founded in 2016 by a group of volunteers who were looking to make a difference in their environment here on Long Island. Um, we are permitted to respond to live and deceased marine mammals and sea turtles. So when an animal washes up on the beach, we call that a stranding. So a stranding is in, when any injured, sick, or dead animal washes up, and if the animal does happen to be deceased, then we will go ahead and perform a necropsy, which is uh, an autopsy, but on an animal. So these mortality investigations give us a way of kind of getting an inside look at how did this animal live its life? Did it have a full stomach when it died or was it an empty stomach? Did the animal have any evidence of having children recently if it's a female? Um, you know, were there any fishery any interactions or any human interactions? So we're really just trying to get an idea of um, this animal's life and uh, how well was it living. We also survey for uh, the presence of diseases. And this is of particular interest because if it happens to be a contagious disease, then this kind of puts us on high alert and um, it's possible that other animals in the area could be infected. So that's always something that we're looking for when we are conducting our necropsies. Um, we also do um, seal population assessments and health assessments. So we actually go out and we're the crazy people that capture the seals and we um, take their measurements, we collect their weight, we'll get samples on them and we do um, survey them for presence of diseases. We'll look and see if they're pregnant. And if possible, we will actually attach a satellite tag to them. And when we attach these satellite tags, we're able to track the animals and see where they are moving throughout our waters. Um, if you guys don't know, seals will actually haul out where they take themselves out of the water, whether it's on rocks or on um, a sandy beach. And um, we'll, from the satellite tag, we'll be able to see what haul out sites they're using regularly, which is really important for our data analysis and research projects, but also for stakeholders our um, government officials to know what areas these seals are frequenting and if those areas need um, extra protection from um, a variety of things. We also host education and outreach programs like this one here with you guys tonight. Um, it's really a great way for us to engage with our community members, but also as you'll see as I move through this presentation, we could not do what we're able to do as an organization without the help of volunteers, interns, community members. So you guys are really important to us and I'm really happy to have the opportunity to engage with you this evening. So like I said, Marine Conservation in New York, we need you, the general public. So we're actually a really small staff. We only have eight staff members and only about half of them um, are in the field as field biologists. So this is actually a picture of our biologists measuring the carapace of a deceased sea turtle. And um, as you can see there, we've got some people in blue shirts, people in white shirts, and we have some of our volunteers there with us. So our volunteers, once they're trained, can actually join us for strandings and necropsies, um, which is a big help whenever we have a large whale. So um, we, you know, train our volunteers very well so that we feel comfortable taking them out in the fields and working in a, a high stress situation like a stranding. 
We also work with our local uh, state, federal uh, agencies because almost all of the animals that we work with are federally protected. Um, and most of them are either endangered or threatened. So we work very closely with these government agencies to respond to the strandings because animals don't always um, strand in the uh, area that is the most accessible. So they will help us get access to the animal. They might pull the animal up out of the um, water line if the tide is going to be coming in or out and could take the animal. Um, so we partner with them a lot and really enjoy the uh, relationship that we have with them. We also have interns that work with us. This is a picture of a previous intern measuring the carapace or the shell of a cold stun Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. So we're gonna get more into cold stunning later in the presentation, um, but this is a huge help when we have many hands on deck to help with cold stunning sea turtles in the late fall, early winter. And then we have members of our community who join us for beach cleanups, education programs, um, just activities out in the community. It's a great way to engage. And right now it's also a great opportunity to do a socially distanced activity outside in the fresh air and the weather's finally getting warm. So um, we could not fulfill our mission without all of these other people um, helping us and striving to um, protect the marine ecosystem around Long Island. So my first question for you guys tonight, how many species of sea turtles are found in the world? And if you don't wanna shout it out, you can put it in the chat and Jen will read it to me. I haven't seen anything come through just yet. All right, anybody wanna just take a wild guess? Any guess is a good guess. <laughs> 25. I heard 25. Wow. 25. Um, in the chat, we have a guess that says 10. Okay. I think that we have four here. So there's got to be more than 10 probably. So I'd say about 15. All right. So we've got a few guesses now. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you it is actually... Seven. <laughs> there's only <laughs> there's only seven species of sea turtles worldwide, and we have four of them here in New York. So now we are going to go through them. So we have the flatback sea turtle, the green sea turtle, the hawk's bill, the olive ridley, the Kemp's ridley, the leatherback, and my personal favorite, the loggerhead. So seven uh, species of sea turtles found in the world. As you can see, they all look pretty different from each other. Um, anatomically, they're very similar though, uh, but they do live all over. Um, they have a wide range of habitat, um, especially because they all, as reptiles, they will hatch from eggs. And so they kind of live their life really utilizing all parts of the um, marine environment and our oceans. Um, so we are going to focus on the four that you can see in and around New York. So the first is the Atlantic green sea turtle. So this is the largest of our hard shelled sea turtles. So that's an important fact as we get uh, farther into this uh, presentation. Does anybody know how they got their name? You know, and as scientists, we are very clever. We named it the Atlantic green, just a color. But does anybody know why it has that name? No guesses? Oh, we just had one guess come through the chat and it says they are herbivores. Yes, they are herbivores. Um, and that's part of how they got their name. So their name actually comes from the green colored fat that is under their shell and that fat is green because they are eating the um, you know, seagrass and other plants and vegetation. So the green you know, chlorophyll pigment that plants have, it makes their fat green. They are the only um, herbivore species of sea turtle and they are listed as in threatened, uh, threatened under the Endangered Species Act. 
And um, like I said, their diet consists of mostly seagrass and algae. Now we have the loggerhead. So they're actually the second largest of our um, hard shelled sea turtles. They also are the most abundant species uh, that nests in the United States. And their name actually comes from their really large head, which you can see in this picture. And they have very strong jaws. So their diet actually consists of hard shelled prey, such as whelks and conchs. And they use their jaws to crush the shell to get to the animal inside. And they are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Now we have our Kemp's Ridley. And if you guys didn't know, we actually have four Kemp's Ridleys currently in our care at our offices in West Hampton Beach. Um, they were cold stun Kemp's Ridleys. So we've enjoyed taking care of them and we're hoping they're gonna be released really soon. But the Kemp's Ridleys are the smallest species of sea turtle. And they're actually named after a man named Richard Kemp, who was a fisherman in Key West and he actually submitted the first species for identification in 1906. Uh, they are listed as endangered, which is why it's really important for us during cold stunning season to monitor all of the beaches and make sure um, that any turtles that are washing up, most of them will be Kemp's Ridley sea turtles, um, that they are responded to immediately and given the proper care that they need in order to be rehabilitated and released because they're endangered, their population numbers are pretty low. And so any opportunity that we can to make a difference in that way, we try our best. Um, so the Kemp's Ridley is one of two species of sea turtles that engage in something called an adibada, which is actually where they all nest at one time. So um, basically all this huge group of females gather offshore in the ocean and they all decide that they're gonna go up and nest at the exact same time on the same beach. So the nesting in large groups, it's thought that it could be a defense mechanism against predators um, or a result of some environmental factors which could influence their nesting habits. We don't really know because we are not in the minds of a sea turtle. But um, with many turtles coming ashore together all at one time, um, many nests will then hatch at the same time. So um, we it's thought that it could help reduce the predation of the hatchlings as well, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But they have a lot of um, stressors when they're first uh, hatched out of their egg and trying to make their way to the ocean. So um, the other species that uh, will nest as a group and hatch all together is um, the Olive Ridley, which we do not see here in New York. Uh, the Kemp's Ridley diet consists of crabs and they'll also scavenge on um, dead fish and um, any discarded bycatch from uh, fishermen. Here we have the leatherback. Does anybody know how the leatherback got its name? Anybody want to take a guess? I haven't seen anything come through just yet. Oh, we have one guess come through. It says soft shell with a question mark. Yes, you're right. So remember earlier I told you that the green sea turtle was the largest hard shelled turtle. So the leatherback is the largest and only soft shell turtle. Um, they have a soft leathery shell that covers um, their long longitudinal ridges that you can see really clearly in this picture. So they're highly migratory and they will swim over 10,000 miles a year between their nesting and their foraging grounds. And they're also really deep divers, which is where their soft leather shell kind of comes into play because as they dive and their max depth reaches about 4,000 feet. So as they're diving down, their shell will actually um, collapse on them almost and compress, which is really important to help with their buoyancy, the gas exchange in their body. And it also helps when they're coming back to the surface and slowly expanding um, as they're getting ready to come up and take a breath. 
Um, so they can actually dive deeper than some marine mammals, um, which is really cool. But because they um, have this leathery shell, they also have really interesting uh, jaws. So they have a pointed tooth-like um, cusps uh, and sharp edged jaws that are kind of jagged. And it's perfectly adapted for the diet of jellyfish. So um, their mouth and throat actually have backward pointing spines that help them retain the you know, slippery prey that they're eating. Um, so they do have a strictly jellyfish diet. So you might be wondering, okay, these are all really interesting, but why are they in New York? We know they don't hatch in New York. So you are right. Sea turtles do not nest up um, on New York beaches. They mainly prefer the Southeast region of the United States, the Caribbean, Mexico, you know, those nice warm beaches. Um, but we actually did have one nest up here. Does anybody remember? Which sea turtle species made that nest? And just to give you guys a hint, this was in 2018, so just a couple of years ago. Yeah. It's an endangered species. No guesses in the chat yet. All right, well, I'll go ahead and tell you. It was a Kemp's Ridley nest, uh, which is really interesting because you know, typically we see them in their somewhat juvenile stage of life when they're washed up as cold sun. Uh, but this time we had a nesting female and she did lay her nest and the they were actually laid um, on a, a park. And so the National on National Park Service land. So it was their responsibility to take care of the nest, um, monitor it, make sure that nobody like disrupted the nest because it's an endangered species. So the nest did end up hatching, which is great, um, especially because um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with what happened, but a storm was washing in they were really worried that the nest was going to become flooded. And so they actually ended up removing the eggs from the nest, incubating them for, it was a short period of time in a closet. And then they actually, once the eggs looked like they were starting to kind of move around and getting ready to hatch, the biologists from the National Park Service took the turtles back out and um, let them hatch and walk to the ocean. So that's why um, a lot of people don't know this. It's really important when turtles hatch that they walk themselves to the water. Um, if you go to some places that let you participate in the, um, you know, hatchling release process, um, some people will let you hold them and kind of put them in the water. It's really best to let them walk themselves there, as silly as it sounds. Because if you think about it, they've been in this egg for typically about 60 days, they are incubating in these eggs. And so then they're utilizing their new muscles to walk themselves to the water, and then they begin to swim in the sargasm line. So it's really important that they get those muscles moving and kind of get used to their environment um, and become strong little sea turtle hatchlings. And does anybody know how they find their way to the water once they hatch? And I'll give you a hint, typically they hatch at night. Do they go to the moon? The moon? Yes, yep. So they use the reflective light of the moon off the water to guide them to the uh, ocean. And that's why um, there's a lot of rules and regulations in place, um, especially down in the Southern states for any hotels, condos, houses that are on the water you have to either have your lights off at a certain point of time in the night or your lights have to be red. 
So you can actually buy um, like red light bulbs and um, that way you're not distracting the hatchlings from where they should be going, which unfortunately it does happen quite a bit. The hatchlings kind of get all turned around and confused. They walk to these lights, um, which are up on people's houses, or they walk up into the dunes and towards roads. So that's why down south, you'll see a lot of houses, especially in the summertime, have red outdoor lights on at night or no lights on at all. And Lindsay, we actually had a question come through um, specifically about when we had the nesting Kemp Ridley a few years ago. Um, did they stay near the New York area is the question that came through. Did the hatchling stay? Yeah, I believe that's what she was asking. So uh, when, when sea turtles hatch, they we have no way to track them. And actually like they never meet their parents, nothing, the mom, she'll come up, she'll lay her eggs. Um, she covers the hole back up and then she goes back out and they will never meet. Um, if you're asking about when they were removed from the nest during that storm, they did stay in New York, <laughs> just nearby um, in some of the National Park Service offices um, to be incubated. But when they go out um, as hatchlings, it's actually called a hatching frenzy. And there's no way for us to know um, where they go. Um, I would hope that they're so young, uh, they need warmer water. Even, you know, this was laid in late summer, early fall here in New York. So hopefully they went down south pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, there's really no way for us to track turtles. We actually... Um, they have a period of life called the lost years where we have no idea where they go. <laughs> when they're hatchlings, they hang out at the surface. They don't really go more than a couple feet deep uh, below the surface line. And um, they hang out in the sargasm. They're just eating the little organisms that are living in there. And then when they get older, they go out into the deep ocean. And then as juveniles, they'll actually hang out in bays and estuaries with that warm water and a lot of organisms that they can feed on. And then when they're adults, they go back out into the deep water and they only come near shore to um, mate. And then the females come ashore to nest. So um, males actually never return to land after they hatch from their uh, egg casing. They have no reason to come to land because they're not going to nest. And um, if you think about it, a lot of the sea turtles, their body weight is really heavy. And so when they're out in the water, they're not really feeling that effect. But when they're on land, it's like their entire body weight is just laying on all of their organs. Um, so unfortunately, to answer your question, <laughs> no, we don't know where they went. Um, but hopefully I would, you know, hope that they found a nice sargasm line and headed down south to warmer waters, um, especially for the up, that upcoming winter season. Any other questions, Jen? Uh, that was the only one that I've seen so far. Okay. Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah. Um, so like I said, when the females come up, they dig a hole. The nesting process can take quite a long time. Um, and the females will also do something called a false crawl, which is when they will walk up on the beach, kind of take a look around, and then they'll actually walk back out to the water without laying their eggs. Um, that can happen for a variety of reasons. They might have gotten spooked by a predator or something that they heard, something that they saw, or maybe she just didn't feel quite ready yet. Maybe she didn't like that spot. We'll never know, um, but when people monitor the beaches down south um, during sea turtle nesting season, the beaches get monitored every single day. Depending on the certain area that you're in, um, you could have multiple nests on in one area. And so um, when the females do lay a nest, it's visibly obvious um, to humans on the beach the next day, you'll see her tracks. And actually different species of sea turtles can be identified by their tracks. And they'll also have kind of like, um, like a small little ant mound almost, uh, but turtle sized. 
um, in the sand and that's where they laid the eggs. Um, so down there, beach monitors will mark off the nest. Um, they put a little sign on it that says, you know, it's a federal law, do not mess with the nest. Unfortunately, there is um, natural but also human caused problems with nests. So in some areas, um, especially like in the Caribbean and Mexico, there are animals such as raccoons, wild dogs that will come and disturb the nests. Um, unfortunately, some places humans will go and actually steal the eggs. Um, so it's an, an issue that is well known, hopefully working towards solutions um, to stop that. But these eggs, it the females can nest for a few times during the summer months, um, but they only have to mate once. So they kind of mate once and then the eggs grow at different stages. They'll lay um, a clutch of eggs, which is somewhere from about 80 to 100 each time they lay a nest. Takes about 60 days for the nest, um, for the eggs to become fully grown and developed. And um, does anybody know how the sex of sea turtles are determined when they're in their eggs? Like how do they become a boy or a girl sea turtle? No guesses so far. This is a, a fun fact that you guys can um, whip out at trivia one day. Oh, we actually had a guest come through the chat. It says temperature. Yes, very good. So it is the temperature of the sand that actually determines whether the egg is going to be a female or a male sea turtle, um, which is why climate change is such a popular issue when you're talking about sea turtles. So the cooler sand um, will produce uh, male turtles and warmer sand will produce female turtles. So why do you guys think people have kind of connected this issue of climate change and global warming with sea turtle nests? Uh, we had one comment come through that said would create only one gender of turtles. Yes, so for these threatened and endangered species, that's a little bit of a problem because then our females are going to have a decreased number of males to mate with, which can obviously lead to lower population numbers, but also a lack of genetic diversity, um, which can be a problem in these animals. They can, that could then lead to kind of um, physical deformations um, and things like that. So something that we, that's, we don't wanna see um, in our future, sea turtle populations. Um, so that's why uh, climate change and global warming are such uh, hot topics when talking about our sea turtle species. And uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, when hatchlings are heading to the ocean, they do have predation when they're in their nests from raccoons, wild dogs. But as they're walking to the water, unfortunately, a lot of birds think that they look like a great meal. <laughs> um, so they have that struggle then with the lights and getting confused and turned around. Um, so that's why a lot of places um, will actually excavate the nests um, after, it's typically somewhere between five to 10 days after the nests hatch. Uh, some, in some places, biologists will go down and dig up the nests. And if there are any hatchlings still in the nests and alive, They'll actually take them to a sea turtle rehabilitation facility and get them prepped and ready for release. And in these cases, uh, typically they go to the beach at night and release the turtles um, themselves. They try to do it in a discreet location so not a lot of people are around. Um, but if some turtles hatchlings are in a rehabilitation place for a longer period of time and they kind of grow a little bit, they can be released farther out. It doesn't have to be from shore, but that's definitely on a case-by-case -case basis. So as I said, once the sea turtles um, have their little hatching frenzy, 
and they go out into the water. They go into that sargassum line and um, hang out, eat lots of little critters. Um, they don't dive that far down, um, you know, no more max like three feet uh, below the surface line. So you're probably wondering, how do they get all the way up here for, to Long Island if they're hatching down in places like Florida, Georgia, South Carolina? Um, some might even go all the way north to Virginia, but that's not many. Um, so they kind of stick down to those warmer southeastern beaches. Um, so they'll come up here around four or five years old and they will take advantage of the Long Island Sound and its estuary ecosystem and all of our bays and harbors and they'll uh, hang out. And um, that's why we see a lot of that similar age uh, washing up during our cold stun season in late fall and early winter because they're all kind of traveling together, although they're not very social animals. We actually had a question that says, do they ride the Gulf Stream current? So some do, yes. Um, and it also depends on their uh, age that they are and where they're going together. But yeah, in the Gulf Stream, typically you'll have um, your greens, um, Atlantic green sea turtles and your loggerheads. So we are going to review what they eat. I kind of told you earlier, so we'll see if you guys remember. Um, go ahead and put your answers in the chat, but which species eats lots of seagrass and algae? We have one guess that says, oh, a couple of guesses that say green. Yes. Good job. <laughs> Who eats our um, whelks and our conchs and these hard shelled animals? Uh, I have a couple people that have said loggerhead. One person said leather sea turtle. Loggerhead is correct. And what about our little, um, like our shrimps and our crabs and some dead fish? Uh, we have one that's, one guess that says Kemp. We have two guesses that say Leatherback. So it is our Kemp's, very good. And our Leatherbacks, remember they have that kind of serrated jawline. So they're gonna be our jellyfish eaters. So they feast just on jellyfish. Good job, everybody. So now we're going to go through uh, some threats that sea turtles are facing in our waterways. So unfortunately, environmental disasters is something that can have a really big effect on them. Um, I'm sure you guys remember the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that took place in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. Um, and actually some of our AMC staff members were able to travel down to Louisiana and help with the um, recovery of the animals that were impacted by the oil spill, um, like this Kemp's Ridley sea turtle here in this photo, getting a nice little bath. Um, so about 500 turtles were recovered from the Gulf of Mexico needing um, assistance from the oil spill. And a good majority of them were able to be released, which is great news. Um, but oil spills can be really challenging for sea turtles and all marine life. Um, but oil is carried through all of the um, area that the sea turtles are inhabiting at every age. So from hatchlings all the way to adults. Um, and a big reason that the, it impacts sea turtles so much is because they breathe air. So they need to come to the surface and put their head up out of the water to take a breath through their little nostrils, but they do hold their breath for diving for an extended period of time. Um, but they do come to surface uh, several times within an hour um, if they're not actively feeding. Um, and so because the oil is going to float on top of the water, when the sea turtle breaks through the surface, it's going to get oil 
in its nose, in its eyes, in its mouth. Um, unfortunately, it can inhale the vapors from the oil into their lungs and it can affect their mouth, their throat, their digestive tract. Um, and it can you know, almost get to a point of becoming unable to swim, it's so sick. Um, and unfortunately with our hatchlings that are at the surface and in that sargasm line, they don't, if there's an oil spill, they're not really getting a break from that pollutant. It's constantly in their face and then affecting their body. Uh, the female uh, sea turtles can actually ingest so much oil that it impacts the, um, the development of their reproductive system. It can impact them when they go to have children um, and really uh, impact the developmental process of their eggs, which is not something that we would like to see. Um, it can also, they have a mucous membrane around their eyes and it can impact their vision as well. Um, so all around oil, not a good uh, place for any marine animal be, to be, but especially our um, endangered and threatened sea turtles. And that is why AMCs has a, uh, a mobile response trailer, the, the trailer here in this photo. Um, so it's 26 feet long and it's able to be moved anywhere um, and anywhere that we would need to respond and can also facilitate a mass stranding response um, for sea turtles, but also for marine mammals as well. Um, and it can actually function as a laboratory as well if we needed to run samples or anything like that. Um, we actually, we also have a tent that we can set up and um, factor uh, use as a triage hospital and can use all of the equipment that we keep stored in this trailer to respond. And that's one way that AMCs is working to be ready for any environmental or natural disaster that would require the use of a mobile response trailer. And here you can see the inside of it with all of our gear. Um, the orange backpack is our um, stranding response backpack. So it has all of the supplies in there that we would need to respond to a marine mammal or sea turtle. So um, besides an environmental um, threat, there's also unfortunately marine debris ingestion. So um, I'm sure you guys have seen the images out there of turtles eating plastic bags or um, fish um, and birds eating cigarette butts and little pieces of plastic. So unfortunately marine debris is a global issue. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. So all we can do is work towards um, bettering our community and our local ecosystem. And unfortunately, I'm showing you a picture of one of our biologists conducting a uh, necropsy on a stranded deceased leatherback sea turtle. So this leatherback actually washed up in Southampton uh, about two years ago. Um, in 2000, well, about three years ago now, in 2018. And um, during the exam, the biologists found all of this debris in the sea turtle, including that 15 gallon trash bag you can see there in the middle. Um, unfortunately, with a lot of our animals these days, there's going to be some evidence of um, plastics or marine debris if we were to look for microplastics. Um, we don't do that at every necropsy because that is very time consuming and our necropsies are done in the field. Um, so we don't find all of the debris that I'm sure is in there, but big items like this are pretty easy to spot when you're looking through the animal's uh, stomach and digestive tract. So we found pieces of plastic and a food wrapper along with that very large trash bag um, so as I mentioned earlier, leatherbacks, they weigh up to about 1,500 pounds, so they're eating a lot of jellyfish because that's what they eat on, and unfortunately plastic bags um, are a great replica of jellyfish out there in the wild, and sea turtles mistake them for food, and oftentimes that can lead to a blockage in their digestive tract, um, and unfortunately that leads to their uh, death by them starving um, and becoming really sick. So um, 
yeah, it's a shame. Next thing is our fishery interactions. So um, here in this photo, uh, this is from the North Carolina Aquarium. They had a loggerhead come in with um, a J hook, a circle hook, and a stingray barb. <laughs> so unfortunately, this guy or girl was, um, had a lot going on. And you can see the x-ray down here on the bottom right. Um, you can clearly see the hooks um, in the sea turtle's esophagus. Um, does anybody know what to do if you were out fishing and you hooked a sea turtle? Any Don't guesses? Yeah. Oh, we just got one guess. It says call, call wildlife patrol, but not sure of their number. That's okay. We'll give it to you at the end. <laughs> so yes, making a phone call is a very good first step. Um, but say you're out fishing and you've hooked a turtle. You don't realize until it's pretty far up on your line. So we always tell people, do not cut the line because <laughs> if you cut that line, that's when we lose where the hook is in the turtle. So if you have a turtle hooked, keep it hooked until um, a professional arrives. Um, I moved up here in January from Florida and I was down in the Sarasota area and before that Miami and the Florida Keys. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of people, especially during the summer months, hook turtles um, when they're fishing. It's kind of just a part of it. Um, they're going after what you you have on your line. And um, so a lot of people, when they hook a turtle, they immediately cut the line. And we say, if you cut the line and then you call the stranding hotline, the best thing to do is to tape the line to the carapace so that the um, when a sea turtle is picked up, they'll be taken to a rehab facility. And then the vet or vet tech can actually be able to trace where the hook is in the sea turtle's um, mouth or throat and esophagus. Um, so it's really important that you never cut the line and let it go. Never let a turtle go with a hook in its mouth. Um, I can tell you it won't be um, a nice way for the turtle to go. And um, unfortunately, you're really only doing it harm. You're not setting it free and letting it go about its life. It won't have a normal life with that hook um, in its mouth or in its esophagus. So there are a couple different kinds of hooks. And you can see in this photo, um, they look visibly different. Um, so they have what we call J hooks and what we call um, circle hooks. So as you can see, the circle hook looks like a hook. <laughs> um, and the, they've been put into place where the circle hooks are preferred over the J hooks because it makes it a lot harder for a sea turtle to face any long-term or serious injury from these circle hooks because they're um, shaped to hook in the turtle's mouth and not be swallowed. So therefore it can't impact the esophagus where if a hook is to rip or um, perforate the esophagus, that's kind of leading to the sea turtle's uh, demise. These hooks are often used for long line fishing and uh, long line fishermen are typically looking for sharks, tuna, swordfish, um, you know, these larger fish species. Um, and long line is monofilament fishing line just let out of a boat and they have hooks on the ends um, and they're basically just waiting for an animal to take the bait off of the hook. But that bait also looks really good to sea turtles. So that's why sea turtles end up on a, on a lot of our long lines. Um, and they've also worked to change the material of the hooks. Um, so that they corrode a lot faster. Um, unfortunately, the corroding hooks typically do cost a little bit more than the hooks that don't corrode easy enough, but it kind of gives you peace of mind as a fisherman that if your hook was to be swallowed by an animal, specifically a sea turtle, that it will not live forever in the sea turtle. It will eventually break down, as you can see in this photo here, um, it was beginning to break down and kind of break apart where the um, hook on the other side is not. 
So moving on to our bycatch. Um, so unfortunately, sea turtles are also um, one of the animals that get caught in our bycatch nets a lot. Um, and bycatch is uh, defined as the unintentional capture of a non-target species. So it's an animal that the fishermen were not going after. Um, it's a big issue in the fishing community that it does impact our sea turtles. Oftentimes, um, especially in the shrimping industry uh, because of the nets that they're using, like the trawl nets. And um, typically the trawls are just towed behind the boats and um, they're just trying to catch shrimp. And unfortunately they catch a lot of other species besides shrimp. Um, and they can tow these nets for about half of an hour or more, and they catch anything that's in the area, uh, which unfortunately includes sea turtles, which are thinking they're really lucky by getting a great meal of shrimp. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the case. So in the Gulf of Mexico, um, it's actually required that uh, all fishing gear have a turtle excluder device, or a TED is um, what it's called a lot. And um, because when these turtles are swimming through the net that's not intended for them, um, the force of the turtle on this trap basically um, shoots them up uh, and out of the net um, and using like that ramp system, as you can see in that photo. And it's proved to be about 70% effective um, in reducing the deaths of sea turtles in this particular fishing industry. Um, so it goes to show that there's a lot that we can do to work with our local fishermen, stakeholders, and governing agencies um, to make um, devices and put protections in place to protect our larger uh, marine species out there and still allow our fishing economy to thrive and provide for um, the people that enjoy seafood. So moving on to entanglements. Um, unfortunately, as we talked about earlier with bycatch, um, sea turtles do become entangled in fishing net, fishing line, and um, it's an issue that we see qu quite frequently all over. Um, the, a lot of this netting is um, discarded, so it'd be considered marine debris. Um, so it's, you know, net that was lost off a boat um, or fishing line that was lost off a boat and unfortunately has just become wrapped around sea turtles. Um, so if it doesn't lead to their death immediately, um, it can inhibit the way that they swim, the way that they eat, um, their diving ability. It can actually become so embedded in their flippers that it can lead to an infection, even an amputation. Um, so unfortunately, we do see this uh, quite a bit um, in our sea turtle species. This is an image of Kim, our uh, necropsy program coordinator. And she is trying to set a very large leatherback sea turtle, um, releasing it from being entangled in a gill net. Uh, as you can see, the turtle is pretty agitated, not very happy to be in that net. Um, so we work with um, a lot of members of our stranding network and we are responsible for putting together um, a team to disentangle sea turtles in New York waters. Um, and this is just one example of why we take our trainings very seriously. We work really hard with um, neighboring programs to um, be specialized in this area of disentangling sea turtles and other animals from nets um, without injuring them more and injuring ourselves. Um, I don't think that flipper would feel very good if it hits somebody. Uh, so Kim's being very careful, but um, if you're ever out on a boat, we do ask that, and you happen to see an entangled sea turtle or any other marine animal for that matter, um, make sure you notify the Coast Guard, Channel 16, and the stranding organization in your area. So this goes for, if you're anywhere within the United States um, or other countries, um, notifying the proper authorities and getting that animal help as quickly as possible is what's going to be the best thing for its survival. So unfortunately, um, 
This is an image of a boat strike loggerhead from 2020. It was one of our animals that washed up. Um, vessel strikes are a huge issue for sea turtles because they do come to the surface to breathe. Um, they don't move that fast and um, they unfortunately get hit by boats who um, can be traveling at the correct speed or traveling really fast. So as I said earlier, our sea turtles are in all parts of the ocean and um, they utilize the uh, marinas and harbors and bays, um, which is where boats are going in and out of constantly. Um, so unfortunately, they do have vessel interactions. Um, and it's a major threat to sea turtles around developed coastlines um, and a large percentage of sea turtle strandings in the eastern United States are a result of vessel strikes. So hypothermia or cold stunning is something that we deal with up here in New York in the late winter, I mean late fall, early winter. Um, sea turtles are cold-blooded reptiles so they depend on the temperature of their environment to help them regulate their body temperature. So they normally control their body temperature by moving between areas of water with different temperatures or basking in the sun at the water surface. Um, however, when temperatures rapidly decline, as they do um, up here, when we're getting into winter, uh, sea turtles can be cut off from moving to warmer waters and they suffer from, from hypothermia. So basically they just become so cold that their body kind of starts to shut down and the wind will actually push them up onto the beach. Um, this can become fatal to sea turtles because in their lethargic state, they have decreased circulation of their blood. Um, they're also slowing their other bodily functions and basically just trying to maintain being alive. Um, and they can become uh, at risk of being hit by a boat, by predation from predators. They can become sick, um, getting pneumonia. And unfortunately, if they don't get help, they can even die um, once they wash up on the beach. Um, so this is an issue when temperatures fall below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 10 degrees Celsius. Um, or if they remain in those shallow water areas, uh, that can become really cold as air temperatures drop suddenly. Uh, which can happen during our cold snaps, as we know. So to help us um, monitor our beaches for cold stunned sea turtles, we do this in the winter months, typically around high tide, um, especially along our north facing beaches. Um, and anytime you find a cold stunned sea turtle, you should call the New York State Stranding Hotline number, which is 631-369-9829. And we'll also put this in the chat. Um, so call them and they will send a biologist out to recover the sea turtle and we will get it the proper care that it needs um, in order to be back up to its proper body temperature and hopefully released in warmer waters. So quickly, um, this map shows you our sea turtle, marine mammal and sea turtle strandings from 2017 through 2019. The green squares are the sea turtles. So as you can see, most of them are stranding along our northern shore, which is a result of our um, cold stones. And sea turtles make up about 38% of our um, strandings that we responded to from 2017 to 2019. And 26% of our sea turtle strandings were due to human interaction, which might not seem like a really big percentage, you know, out of 100, but that's 26% of the strandings that could have been uh, prevented. They were caused by humans, whether it's a boat strike or um, a fishery. So um, it's disheartening, but it's something that we are working to change. So if you are monitoring the beach for cold stunned sea turtles and you don't happen to find a sea turtle, that's very good news. <laughs> we don't necessarily want to find cold stunned turtles on our beaches. So when you're out there, you can also do a beach cleanup, which will prevent our sea turtles from ingesting um, any of that marine debris uh, by it washing back out at high tide. So first keep our beaches clean by taking your trash with you um, if you're visiting any of our beaches um, and collecting any other debris that you see along the way. 
Um, be sure to stay at least 150 feet away from a marine mammal or sea turtle that's on the water, in the beach. Um, that goes for anywhere. So they are federally protected animals. And um, obviously, if the sea turtle is cold stunned and it needs help, um, I think you can get within 150 feet and make that call. But um, we definitely never want to touch any animals um, out there in the wild. So as much as I have talked about uh, sick, injured, and dead sea turtles this evening, uh, we also want to know any time that you see a thriving marine mammal or sea turtle out in our environment. And you can report those sightings to sightings at amcs.org. And um, it's really important for us to know when our animals are out in our waters healthy, healthy and happy. And as I said earlier, please report any sick, injured, or dead marine mammals or sea turtles to the New York State Stranding Hotline. Again, the number is 631-369-9829. And with that, does anybody have any questions? I know I covered a lot of information tonight. So if you have any questions that you think of later, um, or maybe you don't want to ask them right now, please feel free to email me at education at amcs.org. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions and talk with you further about sea turtles and the threats that they're facing. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Jen.